Thank you for staying. Uh, my name is Jan, Jan Barkley. I am the sole owner of the Juvenile Mind. Um, what I'm going to do is explain to you how I came in to doing what I do, because uh, it is very fundamental. Um, 20 years ago, I was in, no actually it's longer than that, it's 30, 31 years ago, I was in finance and had a very successful career. Um, and in that time, um, I had a nervous breakdown. Now, I was at the top of my career. Um, I was being headhunted from one bank to the other, all based in Inverness. I've been up here 40 years. And in that time, and back in the day, if you suffered from a mental illness, the first thing that would happen is that you were given time off to recover, and then when you came back, it was a case of, are you up to the job? Well, yes, I was up to the job. I had six months out of my career, and whilst I was out, what I did was I took myself off because my brain shut down. I woke up one morning, my daughter, who was 17 at the time, walked into my bedroom and it was a beautiful spring day, but when I woke up, my world was black. All I could see was this beautiful figure of my daughter ready to go to work. It was a Saturday morning, I'll never forget it. I had the keys to the bank, to the branch in my hand, and I sat in bed tears flew. She said, what's wrong? Don't know. So it was quite a major shock to me and to my family. So I decided in some time during my recuperation that I was going to start to look after myself. Hence started my journey. I started first of all by going down to a retreat. I went down to a hippie commune. Now, when I got there, they were all in floaties. Now, this is about as floaty as I'm gonna get, okay? <laughs> so I did this for Julie, and I said, I'll do floats, but I'm not doing long skirts, and I'm not doing bells and things. But everybody at the retreat was like that, and it was fine. I turned up, strolled up, stilettos, <laughs> suit, hair done, makeup done, the earrings, the look, <laughs> the attitude. <laughs> yeah. What are you going to teach me? I thought. She said to me, right, John, let's take your jacket off. Put your jacket off. Let's take the shoes off. Six inch heels, girls. <laughs> Not bad. I took them off. That's better. Let's take the blouse from inside. Let's take it out. Okay, so I did all that shit. How do you feel? Yeah, I feel good. Do you feel relaxed? Well, uh, getting there. I understood how I was like an onion. There's so many layers that you have to peel back before you get to the real you. I was ready to look at myself and understand what made me work. What, what had happened to me? Why had I come to this place? Why was my mind not willing to work? No, it was the stress, it was the anxiety, it certainly was the pressure. Now I want to take you back 20 years. <laughs> In those days, mental health issues were not um, as sympathetically thought of as they are today, which is phenomenal. We've got as far as we have. So I spent three weeks down there and I learned about meditation, I learned about mindfulness, and I swore blind that from that day onwards, I would do everything within my power to make sure that those that are around me would understand that it's okay. It's absolutely okay to be not right. It's absolutely okay to feel angry holding in emotions, holding in that tension is so disruptive to your well-being. So, I came back, went back to work, back up the top, yeah? But I had my strategies. I walked in from work, 
I get in the front door and I'd literally step like that and it was like that was the work for me I dropped that skin and I walked forward in the house I would play Vivaldi's Four Seasons it was just lovely and my husband now he's from Glasgow and he'd say to me, oh, yeah, that's not bad. <laughs> I said, do you like that? Aye. He says, you feel a bit floaty, don't you? <laughs> I said, it's not meant to make you feel floaty. It's meant to make you feel chill. Aye, doing a grand job. <laughs> Perfect. So he started to come along the journey with me. So did the children. Now, at that stage, um, my daughter, she was coming up to 18, and hey, you know what? <laughs> we had a great time. And my son was coming up for 16. So, usual, teenage children, you know, got to experiment, got to go out, got to come home. Oh, I feel sick. <laughs> Dear, oh, that's a shame. <laughs> really? What did you do? Uh, you don't want to know. I thought, oh, listen, been there, did it, and I actually wrote the book. <laughs> so I wasn't that mum that got hit out. What are you doing? Screaming at them. No, oh, why did you go and come home like that? I was like, oh, you done that, did you? And my daughter the ring went, what did you do on that course? She said, have you reinvented yourself? Cha-ching. Yeah, I have. I said, are you okay? She said, yeah. I said, what's the worst thing that's happened to you? <gasps> I was sick. <laughs> did you learn a lesson? Yeah, I did. Fine. No harm done. So I went back into work and I stuck it for another nine years. Would you believe it? And I went from, from the bank I had the nervous breakdown in. I didn't accredit that bank with it, by the way. <laughs> it was the job. Yeah? So I moved to another bank. And uh, they asked me if I'd go and work for them and do what I did over in the other bike. And I went, yeah, of course I can. Could do anything. I was Keflon coated. Okay, nothing stuck to me. But in that <coughs> environment, we'd have what you call shoulder climbers, right? People that would use you to get where you want to get. So they had decided that I was going to go up to area to become an area manager. And I went away in a course and I decided, mm, don't like this. I do not want to sit at somebody's one-to-one -one and say, where do you want to be in six months? Tell me what it is about the bank you don't like. I find that out, and if she really annoys me and we find that she's not pulling her weight, we put her where she doesn't want to be. Guess what happens? They then leave. Because we know that's not where they want to be. How clever these places and it's not just banks that do that it's all places so it woke me up to this situation that I didn't want to be that manipulative so cut to the chase 11 years ago left banking cha-ching <sighs> so good best decision of my life I set up my own business at uh, first of all it was called touch by Reiki because when I was away I had uh, Reiki sessions which helped me. So I learned Reiki and then I became a Reiki master teacher. All within that nine year scale. And then I set up the business Touch by Reiki and I worked out of a hairdresser's that is now defunct, bless it, um, but it used to be in the Eastgate Centre. And from there I would do um, Reiki and Indian head massage from their rooms. From there People were asking me my advice. Now, that's a really dangerous place to be in. When people start asking you advice and you're not qualified to give it, you've got to be very, very careful. Also, I took that importance on board. Because people were coming back to me six months later and said, oh, but you said, and I thought, oh, did I? <laughs> oh, heck, did I really? So. I then went on and learned advanced clinical hypnotherapy. So the whole genre of what I do now is <coughs> I am an advanced clinical hypnotherapist. I am a meditation and mindfulness teacher and I'm also a Reiki master teacher. That's it.
That's who I am. And within those three, I then help people with anxiety, stress, depression, grief. Things that they can't feel they can cope with. What well, anything that people feel that they are struggling to come to terms with. That's what I help them with. Now, if I know I can't, I have a duty of care. And I will pass them on to somebody that I know that they will be able to help them. So either it's a psychologist or um, a doctor. Before they come to me, I do have them sign a disclaimer and I do get them to say that they have had a medical agreement to come for to see me. But I realise by treat, treating the adults, I'm really only just stemming. It's like blowing out the um, match. You know, you still got the matchstick. The problem's still there. You might sort the adult, but I was thinking, what about the child? What made that adult get to this stage? So I was approached by Alana from MFR, Cash for Kids, and she'd heard about me because, um, I don't know if it's a good thing to say, but I'm well known in Inverness. <laughs> <laughs> All for the best reasons. <laughs> and she'd approached me and she said, Jan, would you be up for coming round to schools with me? She said, would you come and would you help me with a project? to teach the children some coping strategies. Churching, I'm there. Now we didn't get paid for it. We went, Alana and I met up, and we went and we put together a program and we had a teddy bear. And we did Merkinch Primary School, we did the whole school. <laughs> and it was such fun. Honestly, the children are just darlings to work with. Um, and because you're not emotionally attached to them, you can see the rays of sunshine coming out of them. You ask them a question, is please this, please this, and you're like, yeah, okay. So we had a care bear. And what we did was we said, right, okay, how would you cope if someone hurt themselves? What would you do to be kind? Because our program was called Cool to Be Kind. Now, Different classes, different things, share their tuck, give them a hug, give them a cuddle, lend them their coat. And we'd sit there, and honestly, I came out of that school that day, and I just felt so humbled, so emotional. I thought, these children, oh, we're doing it so right. Because these little ones were teaching, oh, sorry, teaching us adults <coughs> just that there is hope. Because what we also did was the strategies we taught them. Instead of going up and going to somebody, which at that age they so want to do, don't they? I'm not getting what I want, so I want what you've got and give it to me. And they take it and run like bullio. They learned. Okay. Take a step back. Walk away. Now, it does take a couple of sessions for them to pick this up. The wee ones, bubbles, <laughs> I love these bubbles. <laughs> it is just tools. They're not gonna carry on as adults doing this. But the children blow out their anger <coughs> and they can see something tangible. That gives them a coping strategy at that precise moment. They're not gonna carry on as an adult blowing bubbles but they will know that there are other things that they can do to take them out of that situation. The day was a resounding success, um, and it was just, from there, um, I sat with Alana, and I decided that, do you know what? There is more to be done, more things to be taught, and more ways to get across to the children. Because if we can teach these children coping strategies, so that when they become adults, they won't be full of anxiety, full of stress, full of worry. And anything I can do to help them get there, then I'll do it. So I then put together a program of my own, and I approached Central Primary School. And I spoke to the headmistress, 
the head teacher, um, and spoke to her. Now, I did this in May last year, and it was agreed we'd do a five week um, session. She would pick the children. Now, I didn't set precedence as to what I expected from the children or what type of child to put in front of me. All I wanted to do was to help the ones that came. So she decided that she would put together five children over the five week period. So I set out um, a timetable of what we would do and what we would look to cover in each session. Because it's not just about doing a session, walking away and hoping it sets in. One session's not gonna work. You will teach them one thing, but it, one thing's not gonna resonate with every individual. Some of you like hot chocolate, some of you like tea, some of you like coffee, some of you like water. There's something for everybody. We're all individuals. So, the first week, I went in and I explained who I was. And I said to them, why, why am I here? And one wee lad put his hand up, he said, oh miss, he said, you're here to make us nice people. And I looked and I said, but darling, you're already nice people. And they all looked and went, really? And I said, aha. I says, I'm here to help you. So when you're in the playground, or when you're in any environment that you feel upset, angry, or annoyed, <coughs> that you can calm yourself down and walk away from it. Happy days. Now, I always had a PSA with me as well. Um, I have got, obviously, disclosure, my full disclosure to work with children and with vulnerable adults. So the first week, we used gel paint. Now, you buy them, Hobbycraft have them, you'll see them, I've got them down on my table, I couldn't bring everything up today, but um, they're down on my table downstairs. And it's a sun catcher, but I renamed it. I called it their dream catcher. Because the importance of this was, it's gel paint. So unlike an ordinary painting, where they would dip it in and slop it on and go mad, that's not mindfulness. Gel paint drips. So what I would do is play some nice music. Now, I've got simply red blasting downstairs, <laughs> so I didn't use that. But I'd use the music that they had within the school, within their relaxation room. So I played that music, and then I spoke to them in a very soothing and relaxing voice. A voice that will calm and relax them. A voice that will help them not feel any pressure. So as they were painting, I asked them to think about things that made them feel happy. If they didn't have memories that were happy, what would they like to do that made them feel happy? Nice, isn't it? Yeah, got you. <laughs> and that's it. They were then captivated. That group went quiet. They sat very quiet and the PSA was looking at me and she's going, okay, and I'm just talking, as I do. Just telling them that all is well within their world and what they're doing is really good. The colours are just beautiful. The soft, gentle music helped. And they felt good. So when they'd finished, we then put them over to one side and they were allowed to stay in that room. And we then named their dream catchers, their happy catchers. And they decided that day where they were going to take, when they take them home next week, where they were going to put them. Some they were going in the kitchen, some was going in the bedroom, some they were giving to their aunties and uncles. So their extended families were going to benefit. 
So in week two, they come bounding in, you can imagine it, bounding in, full of energy, and they're saying, oh, this is what we're going to do today. So I'm like, okay, today, we're going to do pads. And they look at me and they go, oh, pads, what are we going to do here? And um, what I'd done with the headmistress is to check if any of them had light sensitivity because I use strobe lighting that goes on the ceiling. So I had thick mats, not yoga mats, because they're not comfortable. So I, the first thing we did was discuss what we did last week. How did you enjoy that? Yeah, that was good. How was your breathing? And they would tell us. And I'll, I'll explain to you in a minute how each one, how it affected each individual child. So we went on and we then put the mats out. I let the children pick the different colours of mats, put the lights on. And we'd been talking about balloons. So when they're lying on their mat, the music is going, and all they can see is these tiny little balloons in the ceiling. These tiny little balloons with where we would send all our worries, our cares, our anger, our disappointment, all the negative emotions that we were feeling today. We would send them up to the balloons. And as we did, it would get rid of everything and you'd feel so much better. And this was the first time these children had actually had the quality of time to lie, to sit, to have time for themselves. And it was like this, it was quiet. All you could hear was my voice. And the children were lost in that moment. They loved it. So I brought them round, gave them all a glass of water, to awaken their senses. I can't have them coming out of a meditative state. I'm going straight out to play. <laughs> Not a good idea. So a glass of water awakens their senses. We do a little bit of shuku. Yeah. Okay. Feel better? We stamp on the spot. Do you feel good? Yeah. Happy days. See you next week. High five. And off they go. Now each week after each session, I would speak to the teachers, um, the class teacher and also the uh, either principal teacher or the head teacher. And I would tell them what I saw within the class, but also because the PSA was there. She was able to say the difference in each individual child because there was a marked difference from how they behaved with me to how they then behaved in the class but how they behaved within the class was a marked difference. So we would go and I'd say, right, I'd allocate half an hour. Mm, forget that. It was an hour because the teachers couldn't understand how come they would do that for you, but they won't do it for me. <laughs> uh, maybe you want to have my voice. <laughs> I can take it for you. But it was a case of that it wasn't just because it was me. It was because of the space, the time, that moment Mindfulness is not something that you, you can't walk around in a mindfulness state. Right? You can't. But what you can do is be mindful when you walk around. Be mindful of your words, be mindful of your attitude, and that will have an impact on everybody else. So, week three, we went on, they came back, had a quick chat about last week. How did they love it? Fine. This week, we're going to do a cuddle cushion. Now, a cuddle cushion, as I said to them, it can be a, a cushion that you have at home. It could be your pillow. It could be your duvet. It could be a blanket. It could be your pet, as long as you don't squeeze it. It could be anything that they have. You, you've got to be mindful that we're not aware of what their home life is like. So I can't say, you must use this. It could be a sheet. It could be anything that they want to hold. And when we did the meditation, what we did with that was that we released all our anger. Now, in a minute I will explain to you how the different children did that. But to see the release and to see that 
release of tension. You could physically see it on their faces, but not just on their faces, on their shoulders. Because when they came round, they didn't want to let go of that cushion. They wanted to hold on to that cushion. Can I take this with me? I left those cushions there. I'm not going to take them away from those children. So of course, <coughs> darling, you have that cushion. It's a magic cushion. Okay? It's transference. That's what it was. They're transferring their emotions into this cushion. And some children couldn't or wouldn't vocalise their emotions. So this was there as near as they would get to doing it. So on a psychological level, this is like worth its weight in gold. And again, when I spoke to the teachers after that session, they were like, yeah, can you come and work here? I went, no. <laughs> it's very much understanding what the children relate to. And it's understanding that each year, you wouldn't do the same thing with each year. You would do different, because children, for mindfulness and meditation, it should only be a minute for their year of age. So if you've got seven, eight-year-olds, you do seven, eight minutes. You do not do it for half an hour. There's no way they're going to do that. And it's not fair to expect them to do it. So the next one, in week four, we did the mindfulness and the meanings in everyday life. So how could we be more mindful every day? And they were talking about things that they could do, what they could change in their life, what they could do to make things happier for their mum or their dad or themselves. Primarily, I was more in interested in how they would do it for themselves. But these children transferred it again into their family surroundings because in some instances, some of these children came from um, uh, a challenging background. So what they wanted to do was to please their mum and dad. They wanted to be able to make their mum and dad feel more relaxed. So they wanted mum and dad. They, they weren't worried about themselves. So we, I had to adapt that day, that session, to incorporate how would we make, with what would make your life feel better. And some of the answers were heartbreaking, absolutely heartbreaking. But week five, at the end of week four, I said to them that next week is our last week. Well, you'd have thought I'd taken away all their pennies. Oh, Missy, you're not coming back. And I said, well, not, not just yet. I said, I've got to go to another school to go and help them. But I said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I said, you can get to pick what we do next week. How's that? Chapter bits. Yes, please. So we did. And what we did was the lights and the maps. But this time, they asked, could they have it for the whole session? Now I'm in there for an hour. Oh. <laughs> I thought, yeah, I can, you know, I'm used to dealing with adults. Put them into a deep sleep for an hour, it's not a problem. <laughs> Children? Oh, hey, do you know what's a learning curve, isn't it? There's nothing set in tablets of stone. So unless I try it, let's go with it. I'm happy to do it if you're willing. And I knew that if I saw that it wasn't working, I would turn it around and get them to do something else. So it's fine. Well, it was amazing. Um, I had, they came in, we talked about what they'd learned over the whole other four weeks. How did they get on? How were they using it in school? How were they using it in class? And I said, I'm going to get you to give everybody a present when you leave here. I know what. But Miss have no money. I said, no, no, it's not going to cost you anything. All right. What are we going to do? I said, I want you to go up to anybody that looks a bit sad. Just smile. Just give them a smile. And of course, boys and girls sat there and went, oh, what's mine? <laughs> and I'd look and I'd go, and guess what? They smiled. A smile is contagious. Yeah? If I looked at each and every one of you and said, come on, give us a smile. You would. Yeah. It's free. 
and it makes you feel good. Now I could go into the medical point and saying well, it releases good endorphins in the brain and it just takes more muscles to frown than it does to smile. Yeah, we all know that old chestnut. But more importantly, it makes everybody feel good. And that's what we used to do in the corporate world. We used to go around and say, how can you make your colleague feel better? And it's to acknowledge them, it's to appreciate them, and to say thank you. As a manager, when my staff left, I made sure, not to be cheesy, but to actually say to them, listen, thanks for what you did today. I really appreciate your help. What you did today was amazing, thank you. And that's really was fantastic. The children that I had, I had children that were, um, I had a, late, a young girl that was a self-harmer, and she would sit and do this. So when she had the cuddle cushion, she was doing this. You could see in her arms where she'd done it before, and it was all indentation, red marks, scars on her arms. When we did the cuddle cushion, she sat there and she was like, first of all, she was on her arms. Now, I took her hands away from her arms and put them onto the cushion. This was a girl that was so um, withdrawn into herself. She couldn't relate to her peers at all. No relation to her peers. So when she did this, she was like this. And the music was going, and I'm talking about releasing all those fears, releasing all the angers. The tears flowed down her face. She absolutely melted. And the first week she walked in, everybody was there, and she stood here, socially detached. Couldn't relate to them at all. They were inferior. She had a fantastic vocabulary. I said something, and she said to me, oh, I concur with that, Mrs. Barclay. Hockey dokey, I said, well, I'm glad that's conducive to your thoughts. <laughs> but she was a clever girl. And she didn't want to be in the group. But see, at the end of the session, one of the girls, who was a control person, had broken down when she was doing her uh, meditation. And this girl, who'd done the self-harming, when got off of her seat, went round, gave her a cuddle, and she said, it's okay, it will be all right. And I tell you, honestly, the PSA and I were both stood there and the tears came down. Because here was the girl that didn't, couldn't relate, wouldn't relate to her peers at all. So what happened? Well, in the end, um, the teacher whose class I was looking after, she wasn't into mindfulness and meditation. When I was doing it for a, a taste of it, the teacher, she was like this. <laughs> and I thought, oh gosh, right, okay then. <laughs> See, at the end, she came up to me and she said, Jan, she said, can I get this on YouTube? I went, yeah, of course you can. Right. She said, can I keep this going when you're not here? I said, absolutely, it's the whole point. I'm only one person. I, my point, my vision in life is to touch as many people as I can, to show them how simple, how easy it is. You don't have to sit in a darkened room for 20 minutes. I wouldn't even do that. Mindfulness, corporate world. Sit and look at that on your, t on your table. Just watch the bubbles going down. Take that time out. Yeah? The other thing that I use so it doesn't have to be things that are complicated. It doesn't have to be things that are beyond normality. Being mindful should be part of your day. Practicing mindfulness, yeah, five minutes. 10 minutes, as much as you can, watching the raindrops going down a window pane. I've now taken this program to a